Hi, I'm Doyle with Southern Paranormal. Tonight we're at another haunted location. We're at the Old Lincoln Hospital in Fayetteville, Tennessee. I'm joined here with Mr. Mark Kelso. He has had many experiences in this location. He's gracious enough to come out and talk with us and tell us some of his stories, and he's gonna give us a walkthrough of the location. You've probably seen this show featured on Ghost Adventures and a few other TV shows as well. We decided to come here and dig in and see what we could find ourselves. What are some of the things that have you have experienced in the location? Well, I started working here uh, initially back in 1973, and, and most of my experiences was really collecting stories from other employees that I worked with and had experiences. I didn't have any first-hand experiences until I started bringing paranormal groups here. But I worked here, like I said, for two or three years in the early 70s, and then I came back in the late 90s and worked here, and still currently are employed by the hospital system, uh, but worked here up until the hospital moved to its current location, uh, which was September 10th, 2011. Oh, I'm sorry, 2001. The day and before 9-11. The day before 9 -11. Yeah, the day before 9-11. So, so. so uh, and you brought, you said, several paranormal groups through. Yeah, and you've I, seen I, some of the stuff that they've caught. It didn't surprise you at the time? Oh, yeah. Things? I mean, I came up here basically as a virgin for paranormal investigation. Had no <laughs> idea what I was getting into. And I uh, had definitely found it to be interesting. Uh, and uh, I tend to try to rule everything out, try to find a cause for it and so forth. Right. I tend to really pay more attention to the stories that are have happened to more than one individual and are the same, right? and so forth. And the first trip, uh, we, we collected over 400 recordings of the spirits talking to us on tape 400? And roughly about 15 questionable photographs. And one of the things I had looked into was, you know, people claim that a lot of the conversations or things you get from, uh, or interference from like ham radios, things apparently with spirit boxes and so forth. Right. Uh, we did one spirit box session up here, and there was information that was given to us that nobody with a ham radio would have known. Only myself and the person that was actually talking to the spirit at the time would have known that information. Where was uh, that captured at in here? Th that was actually in the snack bar, which we'll That's go into, brilliant. and I'll give you a story about that one. Uh, but we had several cases out of those 400 recordings. You had the typical ones that would get out here, leave me alone, you know, nice. you're welcome, thanks you know, so forth, but we actually had some of them that inserted comments into our conversations that were going on between us. Oh, wow. So, I mean, a lot of times that's when you catch the best evidence is when you're unaware and you let your guard down, so to speak, you know? Yeah, I mean, we were sitting there having a conversation uh, between ourselves going up and down a stairwell, and then one of the recorders, one of the spirits put, a con put their two cents in <laughs> uh, as we were going up and down the stairs, and well, I'll take you there, I'll tell you that story and stuff. All right, for the most part, uh, spirits are of friendly nature, or are there others in here? Or We've never had any... Uh, Negative? Never had any physical confrontation. We've had plenty of them tell us where to go <laughs> and to get out and so forth. Uh, and, of course, we all, we've always done a prayer before we went in for God's protection. And when we left, so we don't take anybody home with us. Right. Don't need any, any pastors coming back home, do we? Right. Uh, well, Mr. Kelso is fixing to take us in and show us some of the places and some of the, where some of the activity occurred at. Uh, y'all come along, y'all should find us interesting. Now maybe you can answer a question for me. Sir. The first time we came up here, there was no power rod. There were fluorescent lights still hanging up here in the ceiling. I took a photograph straight down the hallway, like where you're standing, I was actually standing back further, but right through the doorway here and so forth. The light fixture up here had four different color light beams coming out of it. Really? In the photograph. Oh, wow. It don't sound like facing a reflection window, of any kind. And facing that window back there. Wow. So. You still got that photograph or? Yeah, I think so. But I've never <laughs> have been able to figure out why it would have been. It wasn't like an orb, it was like strings of light. Would like to show that to our you know, okay. our viewers and everything. I figured some photography experts will come up with an answer for that, but nobody said anything. Ain't nobody said anything yet, yet huh? Uh, okay, this is the OB unit. Um, as I said, I've, 
I personally brought six different or six paranormal groups here that would actually be about three different groups uh, and I've talked to numerous ones that have come through here uh, one of the things I kept getting from all the other groups is that OB was unbelievably haunted we were never finding anything in OB uh, the old story of hearing babies cry I've heard mm -hmm. every hospital I have worked in and I've been in the medical field for over 40 years I don't mm -hmm. put a lot of faith into that story you know, everybody hears babies crying in no big, you know. Uh, but they all said that, you know, it was just, you know, one guy described it as the portal to hell. And we, <laughs> never, we never picked anything up in here. I mean, so the last time we were up here, we brought a CD player. And one of the guys had a CD of what he called hospital sounds. To me, it was extremely irritating. <laughs> Pages, ambulances going off, people screaming, all this stuff. He had some bright idea. He thought this might make the spirits more active. We put it in a in a uh, CD player in the intersection down there by the front desk as we, that we came through a while back, uh, and it wouldn't play because they had recorded it on a computer or had copied it on a computer. Just kept telling us the wrong format. So we decided on that particular trip we were going to spend a lot of time in OB, and we spent close to an hour in this one location, which we never set, spent that much time in one location. We weren't getting any activity, and nothing was happening. And I finally got tired and I went over here and pull out my rear up on the counter right there. And I said, is anybody here that wants to talk to us? Four of the people stayed over with me. And all of a sudden this voice goes, yes. And we all immediately yep. looked up. And I said, did you work here? Yes. Yeah. Did you work here when it was a hospital? No. One of the women in our group says, did you take care of the babies? I said, he just said he didn't work here when it was a hospital. He goes, he, 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 he. <laughs> I said, did you work here when it was a college? Yes. What kind of work did you do? Paperwork. And then all of a sudden that CD player started playing. Full mm -hmm. volume, blared out. I'm, every one of us jumped in our shoes. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, How long ago was that been? That was the last group that I brought up here, which was maybe about three years ago and uh, but I'm real I still know the primary OB doctor who's a good friend of mine and I asked her I knew that when she was in medical school uh, that she had actually lived in a haunted house because oh, okay. she had told me stories about it and I told her I said you know I've taken all these paranormal groups about your old unit being so haunted and she said oh that place is driving me crazy and I said, what did you experience? He said, I'd go into a patient's room to see a patient. And I'd leave the door open. She said, you remember how heavy those doors are? And I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'd turn around and somebody shut the door and I'd walk into the door. And it happened to me all the time. <laughs> kind of playful, huh? Grab hold that door. Boy. It's not wide, is it? No, sir, it isn't. That ain't gonna close with wind. Uh, no way. <coughs> not even the good push, you know. It immediately stops. Wow. Now, as I said earlier, there was the, the, the young kids that had the airsoft, and she reported the same thing. She'd be in there in the room vacuuming, and somebody come around and shut the door behind her. <laughs> awesome, awesome. We're going around to the emergency room here. You got to bump into each other? Oh. You want to know what's back there? Huh? What's back there? Well, those are delivery rooms. I just saw you. I mean, if you're going to spend the night here, I thought I might tell you where you were. <laughs> it's going to be real easy to get lost here. Yes. <coughs> The, uh, we had two beds here, one by the window, one over here by this thing, same setup there over on the other side. Uh -huh. The nurse's station would have been right there where you see all those electric outlets and so forth. Oh, yeah. The nurse that saw, the first nurse that saw the woman in the cafeteria was looking out that window. And I don't know if you want to walk mm -hmm. all the way over that pile of stuff to see or not, but you have a direct shot 
to the window that we were talking about there. You can actually see out of it? We're one level up from it though, right? Two actually. Two levels up. No, you're right. One. Sorry, one. we're on the second floor. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, when I was working night shift one night, we had a patient in this bed that was on life support equipment that I was taking care of. Uh, two nurses that I still work with were working with a patient over there on the other side. There were two, typically two nurses assigned to this unit. And they were working with a patient over there on the other side. They said they both happened to look up and they saw somebody leaning over the patient with what they perceived as a long white lab coat. They thought it was me because I'm the only one that wears a long white lab coat in the hospital. Mm. And it was a life support patient who would have been one I was taking care of. They turned back around to take care of the patient and she went into a full arrest. Mm. They looked over. I'm not there, they call a code, and they realize the length of time it took me to get here, I'm it coming wasn't from an office up there on the third floor, and so forth. They nicknamed her the Angel of Death, because they think it was the angel coming to take her soul. Take one home with her. Take her soul before him. The story about the physician, the only other one that we can identify, and we'll tell you why we can identify, the nurses would sit here and they would monitor the heart rate on patients throughout the hospital. It's called telemetry. Mm -hmm. So even when this unit had no patients, there had to be a nurse here watching it. So both occasions this occurred, there was only one nurse here, down here by herself, watching the monitors for all the patients in the hospital. Patient was sitting here, since she had her, or I'm sorry, the nurse was sitting here, Said she had her feet up, you know, watching all the monitors and stuff. And saw this gentleman walk by that door right there. Khaki pants, flannel shirt, English riding cap, and loafers. She immediately rolled her chair around here to this side and saw the same gentleman pass that door there. Never heard him open those doors out there. She had no idea who he was. Everybody else did, mm -hmm. because it was a physician here who had passed away under mysterious, mysterious circumstances. And every time he made rounds, he wore khaki pants, a flat shirt, exactly what they saw, English riding cap, and loafers. Wow. She never worked with the gentleman; she didn't recognize him. So he died. Two years later, same incident happened with a different nurse. She knew it. She had worked with it. She recognized him immediately. Same thing. Sitting here, he walks by that door. She runs around right there, and she goes by that door. Uh, we brought some local psychics up here, and they tried to raise him, you know, see, and there was no response or whatever. Uh, another one came back up here, I think I told you that there was a period of time that they were actually charging people to take tours to the building and stuff. She came up here and she said she kind of let the group slip out because she didn't want them to hear him calling his name. And she called his name and she said all of a sudden something grabbed a hold of her and would not let go. And she said it was so bad I couldn't breathe. She said I had to run out of the building and let go and I got out. Wow. Now, is this the doctor that we discussed earlier downstairs? No. He no, just yeah. had to walk downstairs because he felt like he. He felt weird. He's like, I've got to get out of here and went and walked back downstairs to the trailer just now. They want your staff? Yeah. Yeah. In 2007, when I was preparing to bring the first paranormal group up here, uh, there was a, a nonprofit group that was using this room right over here uh, as a uh, place to give away free food and clothing and so forth. What is this room? Uh, it was a gift shop when the hospital was open. I went in and asked the lady, I told her I was going to be bringing a paranormal group that, up that Saturday and just wanted to let them know we were coming. And I said, is this place haunted? And she goes, no, this place isn't haunted. And her, her employee was going. <laughs> <laughs> so after I got her out and I went back and talked to the employee and I said, what have you had happen? And she said, Every night, I turn off the coffee maker, 
every morning the coffee maker is back on. <laughs> every night I turn the lights off, every morning back the on. lights are back on. So forth. They also had a, um, probably going to get the name wrong, I think it's Airsoft when they shoot these little BBs mm -hmm. at each other. They had a group of young people that were renting on the weekends and they were playing that up here and I talked to them and uh, they said that uh, they had seen or had picked up numerous number of orbs in photographs. Now, I don't give orbs a lot of credit. Yeah, same here. And, uh, you know, but the girl said that OV, which we'll go to here in a minute, was one of the most haunted areas she'd ever been in. And every time she'd go in, they would vacuum up these little balls and resell them. And she said somebody was constantly closing doors on her when she was in there. Oh, really? Okay, we're going to come back to that a little bit more. We're going right. here into the snack bar now. This was the snack bar, cafeteria, whatever. This is where employees would eat. It was only open for breakfast and lunch and closed about 1 30 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It had booths by the windows and tables and chairs out here in the center area. Now, this was seen by originally by a nurse from ICU. And when we get up there, I'll show you the view that she would have had at 9 30 one night. She wasn't busy and she was looking out the window. And she looked down there and said there was a woman sitting here in her booth like she was drinking a cup of coffee. She calls the operator and says, who's in the cafeteria? And the operator says, there's nobody down there. It's been closed since 1.30. But the funny thing is, I just got a call from there and there was nobody on the other end of the line. <laughs> she said, I'm going to send the security guard in there to go check on it. So the security guard came down, unlocked the door, came in here, there was nothing here. A month later, a nursing supervisor was a little late coming in to work. Comes, parks out here in the front park lot, and sees the same woman sitting in the same booth at the same spot like she was drinking coffee. Now, when was the hospital built, you say? This hospital, this, actually this building uh, was built sometime after uh, I left uh, employment of this hospital in 1974, and they built it sometime between there and about 80. So this, this was team of room. Dressed in modern clothing, or did they even... They said a hospital gown. Oh, a hospital gown. Yeah. Okay. So like it's a patient. Like it was a patient here. or something down here. So, but this, uh, as the age of the building goes, this is one of the newest sections. Okay. Okay. When was this building first put up? 1912. 1912. Yeah. Okay. And that, that would have been the center section, and then the wings were added on each end later. Uh, as if you're facing the hospital, the left hand wing was the segregated one. And uh, one when I was working here, but you know, we get desegregated by that point. But, and then they eventually, uh, Lincoln County eventually ended up building a black only hospital across town. And so they, that wing was no longer used as the segregated wing, but it was just general patient population. If it's, I think we can cut through here go to OB, if it's clear. Can't be working down the hill again. That place is working down. Oh, Lord. understand them, they, they've commented numerous times that they'll hear somebody down there talking and so forth. Uh, just a quick question to you. Who knows it's in pretty much disarray in the hospital. Was there any storms or anything that may have caused a lot of this or is this just over the years it's just deteriorating? Well just as soon as they finally got the the uh, approval to start building a new hospital, they basically quit doing maintenance on the building. I mean, it didn't look this bad while we had patients here, but well, they just didn't uh, put in time, and so the roof, time, the roof has leaked and, and so forth. And as I uh, told you earlier, the first few times we came, the, most of the windows were gone. I don't know how long it set empty before uh, 
Well, it's about five years because we moved out here in 2001 and it was 2007, six years before I came up here. Um, as I said, it's not in a great neighborhood. While we were trying to move TVs out over to the new hospital, uh, they took them all off the walls and they took one load over to the hospital and they came back, the other load had already been stolen. Uh, and uh, I have friends on the police department that they used to chase homeless people and drug dealers out here all the time. Hopefully we won't run across any. Hopefully not. I guess we let the truck run it, didn't we? <laughs> Well, it'd be hard to hide a ghost trailer going across town. This is the entrance to the emergency room. The first night, the first night I bought the first paranormal group up here, one of the guys gave me an EVP meter. And he said, this thing is really weak. It's like the first one I ever bought. He said, if this thing goes off, you're standing on our toes. And I said, okay. Uh, this actually, that night, was one of our last stops on the trip. And by this time, we've been at about three and a half hours. I was getting pretty tired. They said, well, I don't see what the morgue is. I said, okay, you're going to be this one. It's just this closet out here where these double doors are. Just a little small area. Yeah, that's all it is. Uh, you know, we don't keep... We still, we don't keep bodies for any length of time. The funeral homes come and get them relatively fast, so there's not much of a need for a very big morgue. Uh, I said, those double doors down there on the right, I said, nothing was ever reported down there at some point. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, I was a spirit. I'd be around closer to where I died, and that would be the trauma room over here. So I walked over here, and just as I got to the entrance of the trauma room, that EP meter lit up with every light it had. That's I don't know my skin. They come running around there. I could get the thing to repeat it. And then they decided it's this power meter on the wall. I said, but there's no electricity on in the building. But there's got to be some. That's what it is. That's what's causing it. So a month later we came up. We did the whole deal over again. We went by there. No response from the EVP meters whatsoever. Mm. But, That's interesting. Exactly that one right there. I'm trying to think about them second off. Well, we didn't repeat them a month later. These were the primary rooms. There's no other orders or anything tied to this room and stuff. But, as I said, to me, if I was going to be here, this will be where you can see the first time. saw somebody in there and they'd go back and they'd be gone. And it's happened numerous times, some multiple times, sometimes with the same person. Uh, the night we brought the first group down here, they were coming out the door. I took a photograph of one of the, the women coming out the door here, and there's an outline of somebody else standing right next to her. Wow. And that's awkward. That's awesome. They said typically see somebody they'd have a chair over here for like a family or something. And they'd be, they wouldn't be in the bed, they'd be in the chair. Uh, so like in the 70s or the 90s. So yeah. 
Was that back in the 70s or the 90s when you were here? That occurred in the 90s. Yeah. This, this emergency room, this section of the emergency room was not open until uh, about 1974, just about the time I left my first time. Where is the cardiac room? Right there. This is it? Mm -hmm. That one got cardiac patients primarily, and secondary was this one. That one? Yeah. That was Dr. Sleeping Lounge that you're looking in right now. Oh, really? Yeah, that was that was where the doctor was. Oh, you know, right. Most ER doctors work 24 hour shifts and stuff, yeah. so they usually have a room where they get off and sleep and stuff, but not busy. Radiology. Radiology off here to the left, that's actually the newest section of the building. Um, probably built somewhere in the mid 80s. Uh, laboratory at the very end of the hall down there, and there's no recorded stories in any of those. <coughs> okay. mm -hmm. All right. Got ready to haul some stairs? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, if they were still practicing, I wouldn't hesitate to ask them about it. But most of the doctors that he worked with have passed away. You feel a breeze in here? Yeah. Oh, that's because we're at the, where we came in at. <laughs> the uh, first time I brought paranormal group up here, I wanted to come up and check the safety of the building and so forth, uh, just so I could kind of give them some kind of idea. I didn't know if any of them might decide to bring some children or grandchildren with them. You know, I'd never been through one, so I didn't know what was going to be involved. Uh, and uh, stupid, I came up without a flashlight. And I. <laughs> Went up this stairwell here. This is one that was used primarily by physicians. And there are no windows or anything in it. Got uh, one of the uh, housekeeping personnel that had worked here as long as I had and helped clear the hospital out when it moved. He starts going, oh, you don't want to go in that building. It's full of snakes. And I have real phobia for snakes. And uh, so I said, oh, I said, I'm not worried about it. You know. So I get up halfway up the stairwell. I don't know if y'all old enough to remember this, but Girls up until I was like in eighth grade couldn't wear pants to school. They had to wear dresses. And when they were little, they used to wear petticoats underneath them. And they made this swishing noise. They made this swishing noise whenever they walked anywhere. They couldn't have snuck up on anybody. And I get about halfway up that stairwell, and it's so dark I can't see the hand in front of my face. And all of a sudden I hear this swishing noise going on. And I'm like, I'm getting my flashlight. <laughs> so, so I only left a couple blocks here and went back and left a flashlight and went back. Didn't have didn't anything, anything else happen there. Didn't say didn't anything, anything to the paranormal, paranormal group about that about happening. That happened. Uh, uh, took them, took them through, through the hospital, hospital like I'm doing like I'm now. Told them all the stories and so forth. Didn't they went didn't back went out, out to their car to get their recorders? To get their cameras, cameras, I guess they had their recorders, cameras, get cameras and some, some other equipment, whatever, whatever. whatever. And they, and they, and I could actually park back in the hospital, come up, come up, come up, come up the stairwell, the stairwell, the basement. The guys, the guys got, got up first, met in the snack bar, that was kind of our central, central, central command center. center. And then the women, and then the women, women come up there. And they go, they go, did y'all hear that swishing noise in the stairwell? stairwell? Said, it sounded so like petticoats were wearing an elementary school. And then they were right back to exactly what you heard. So they were actually the Came out of here on the first night. Uh, the lead of the group told the spirits that you know we're here with all due respect, and as a guest, we hope that they accepted us to come in and hopefully communicate with them, build a connection, and so forth. 
Two Spirits told us where to go, and another one said, you're welcome, you've been the nicest person. <laughs> <laughs> this, was the pe this was pediatric floor when I worked here in the 70s. And I worked, took care of a lot of kids on this floor. It stayed that way up until the hospital closed as pediatrics? Uh-huh. And uh, the closest patient I've had in my 40-year career died up here. Mm -hmm. I was walking, we were walking down the hallway. I was kind of in the middle of a group of about five. We passed the room down there, and all of a sudden, two of the girls says, Mark, did you not see that? And I said, What? And I said, the Little girl standing there doorway, just called your name. That was the room she died in. Oh, wow. Never seen her since, or I never didn't see her that night, but we've never seen her since. This one? And I had not told them anything about her, you know, whatsoever, and they described her perfectly. I mean, it wasn't just... Like, I mean, I can see the motion with you. Yeah, yeah. Nurses stations originally actually were turned around so that you went down through the hallway here and you have, you know, one side here and the other side went that direction so that was the passageway down through that way. This would be considered third floor? This is the third floor. Have you got any uh, stories or things you want me to elaborate on? Yeah. Yeah. On this uh, floor? Is it, okay, we had heard that um, that the little girl uh, was kind of um, grab people's hands and kind of walk with her through the building and stuff. I have not heard that any other group had ever seen that little girl until after my experience was made public by this paranormal group who uh, actually did some presentations here for the public. Uh, they played recorders, uh, voices, and so forth, and, and everything. Because the, the author I was telling you about, he actually wrote a series of editor or letters to the editor mm -hmm. and so forth. It actually got the African American population pretty upset, as one preacher put it, and that's what we have mainly surrounding the hospital here. But as one preacher put it, that building was haunted, there wouldn't be any of us in this neighborhood. You know. So now there was a, there is another child that we saw multiple times. Shirley. Huh? Shirley. No name. I have no name for her. I, no, we, I, I'm not saying I, I know the name. I don't know the name for her. Uh, there's only been two spirits that I can identify, and we have no identification for her. Uh, she might have given a name to one of the other paranormal groups. She never would give a name to us. Uh, but she did follow us through the building. But she was more preschool age. Okay. Okay. Um, I gotta get my bearings here. Now, I did have several co workers that said this room was haunted. Uh, I never heard anything from the nursing staff. I'm a respiratory therapist. Three different respiratory therapists I work with said they had experiences in this room of things coming up and grabbing them, hugging them, holding them, you know, so forth. Nothing that they ever actually saw or talked to. I worked out of was at the end of that hallway down there on the right. Uh, once again, I had co-workers that 
said they'd be in there late at night, and they said they they could hear the room breathing. <laughs> kind of ironic, I think, for a respiratory therapist. <laughs> hey. I never experienced that, and they were the only ones that ever said that. So I don't put a lot of faith in it. Uh, this is the only room in the uh, that I've ever been able to identify with staff that actually work here in the hospital of patients having an experience. They never, they never realized they were having an experience. At least the best way to put it, they would call out to the nurses' station and ask the nurses to come get that guy out of their room that was sitting in the chair. Really? And of course, there was never anybody there. And that went on. New medication? Numerous patients. Oh, okay. Uh, so bad to the point that on the night shift, the African American nurses would not take this room. They always had to give it to somebody else. They would not step foot in this room. Oh. And so forth. Uh, and staffs would see. Sitting there. They, they witnessed it. Yeah, too, they would they? witness it too. Wow. They said, so they walk in the room, he'd disappear. Was any, you know, was they dressed in any, they, just, just you know, a, period just, clothing? They or? said usually just like uh, jeans on a flannel shirt, just like he would visit them or something. They have no idea, no connection to time into anybody that was ever in the room or anything like that. Any certain time it like started around the 70s or 80s or this was continued? This to... reported, I heard this originally in the 70s all the way up until we moved. Really? Yeah, wow. Again in the 90s and so forth. Because when I came back in the 70s, I'd ask, oh, yeah, yeah, we don't pay attention to that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so then we had a lot of things we got to where we had to, where we had to not pay attention to or we'd be freaking out. Uh, and as I said, I've been in healthcare about 40 years and in respiratory, the majority of the patients you deal with are in the end stages of their life. And uh, over that time, I guess I've had four patients that told me they were going to die that day, and every one of them been right. And usually within two hours of the time, they're telling me that. So I have a strong belief that people know they're going to die before they do. Yeah. You know, uh, my boss that I work for was hit when we came through the first group. He came with us. And he asked me about this room. He said, "You remember that room? Everybody saw somebody sitting in." And I said, "Yeah." He said. I had a patient that I got her really close to, a lady. She'd lost her husband a couple of years earlier. And uh, he said, I went and gave her treatment one day. And she told me that morning, she said, this is going to be my last day. The Lord called me home. You know, and he said, of course, that makes you perk up. And he right. said, and she points out, there was a wire going kind of from the building across to the pole out there. And he said, there was this really big uh, blue bird sitting out there, really strange looking blue bird. And she said, pointing out there, and she said, that's my husband, he's waiting on me. And he's thinking, well, she's not getting enough oxygen to the brain, she's getting kind of that state. And he said, sure enough, he said, about an hour and a half later, they called a, a code, which is what we page over the hospital when somebody's quit breathing or has a heart attack. And he says, they come in here and I'm working with her, and there's that bird dancing around on that wire and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said, they finally had to give up and pronounce her dead, and the bird flew off. Damn. Wow. Mm. That's very interesting. We just walked out of the elevator like we're doing, I mean, out of the stairwell like we're doing right now. I got about where I'm standing right now. Uh, her groan, I didn't think anything about it. I, I mean, I, I hear groan so much at work, they don't read, even register for me, and I can't even remember the guy that was doing the interviewing or whatever, but. He goes, you didn't hear that? And I said, you brought that room? And he said, yeah. I said, yeah, I just didn't think much about it. I said, I'm so used to hearing groans in the hospital, I don't think much about it or whatever. And I said, besides, I thought maybe it was one of your sound guys or your, you know, carrying all that equipment behind you and stuff, the cameraman. And <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, you'll hear them. I guarantee you'll hear them for the lights on. You now entered the ICU. 
our most critical patients were kept in two beds on that side and two beds over there. And I guess what you call more or less a step down unit now were these three or three beds down through here. The very end, every every floor at the end has what they used to call a sun porch. Uh, here it was used as a nurse's uh, lounge or whatever. Uh, in the 70s, when I worked here, it actually had patients on sun porches. But that was before they really started cutting down, restricting the people being able to get admitted to the hospital and stuff. Mm -hmm. and so, we had to use every square inch we had back then. When y'all check your recordings, do y'all tend to pick up things that you didn't hear when you? Oh, yeah. It records out of a range of human. Yeah. Now, one, of the, one thing they were doing the last time I was there, they were plugging earplugs into their recorders and they said they were actually able to hear better. Right, it, it will uh, basically play back with half a second delay. I have, I have one in my pocket. Just like you would be playing it back after okay. you record it. The OR supervisor still worked for us, a good friend of mine. She told me, and she worked here probably from about 1970, so I'm not sure exactly when she started and said still works for the hospital. said this section right here is the most haunted area of the hospital. Okay. Uh, she actually told me to go into the recovery room and call this patient's name. And, uh, and unfortunately, I don't remember the patient's name. I even had to write it down to remember it for that night. The paranormal investigators called out that patient's name. It's the only time the entire night my flash did not work. Is that I got the streams of light like you were, I was telling you earlier. When I converted to the black and white, it looks like there's a face behind somebody's leg. But at the exact moment that I called her name and hit the flash, we heard a scream. Oh, really? The patient uh, had delivered a baby. Uh, they couldn't get her to stop bleeding. Uh, they had brought her up here into the recovery room to get her ready for surgery. And she passed away before the surgeon could get here. Mm. And so forth. And she apparently was fairly young and stuff. We took... Uh, they took a picture going down the hallway here, and y'all aren't UT fans, so you won't appreciate this, but this is one of the only orbs that they said they ever got excited over. They just took a picture, like from standing down there, down this way. There was a bright orange orb at least four feet across right here in the middle of the hallway. Wow. That's to take note of now. That's one to take note of, Yeah. would say. Uh, but the recovery room is right here. And as I told you the story that was related to this, other paranormal groups told me they had experiences in the OR, but they were, they were always very nonspecific. They did just, you know, I felt funny or something like that and so forth. So, okay. I can, like Donald might have been feeling tonight. Yeah, you know, I guess. You know, I don't know if it's what they ate or if they were actually having experience. The OR suites were down here. Sorry. And of course, over the end, they weren't being led by somebody who worked here, so they very easily could have been over in the DI lab thinking they were in my water suite. Because they look very similar. And you can actually go there and actually more you end up into the way of the side. But these are the two OR suites. It's pretty easy to get turned around in here, I guess. Yeah. yeah. The first night we came through here, we were going up and down the stairwell here. And we had the recorder running like you're doing now. And the wives of one of the guys said something about it. She said, uh, I put those pants on, I put those pants you've got on in the trash can. She said, I don't like those pants. He said, I know, but they're my favorite. He said, I pulled them out to wear tonight. Yes. And all of a sudden, this spirit voice that we picked up on the recorder later says, I like your pants. <laughs> oh, you have a ring on. <laughs> like, didn't know she, he was married. This 
between here is the uh, was in the 70s was a standard medical surgical unit uh, primarily surgical patients uh, by the 90s it had been drug and alcohol center uh, adult, I mean, uh, uh, geriatric psych unit uh, various things we you know health care reform had cut back we weren't keeping patients in the hospital as much and they were using it for all kinds of various outpatient things. Right. Uh, one of the first trips we had up here, uh, actually I think it was the second trip we came up here, I brought a nurse friend of mine whose uh, dad had passed away when she was about three years old. She really basically never knew him. And she was kind of interested in possibly raising him and stuff. Uh, that was her whole point of coming along because we were going to do a spirit box that night. And she was sitting here and had an EVP meeting, meter sitting next to her. I was standing right here, and there was another woman sitting here on the other side with an EVP meter, and all of us had EVP meters. And we just laid them down here on the counter, and all of a sudden hers lights up all three lights. Didn't affect the other two. All right, well. One of the investigators standing there, he said, ask them if they want to talk to you. Tell them to light up the lights. He said, do you want to talk to me? Make all these lights light up. They all lit up. I said, let's swap meters, make sure it's not the meter. So we swapped out meters and she said, can you do that again? And all three of them lit up. In the same location? Same location. Uh, he said, uh, the guy said, ask him if he's male or female. And she said, are you male or female? They wouldn't answer it. He said, it's a male. <laughs> Males won't answer to when they're talking to a female. And he looked at me and he said, you and I need to leave. He told the woman you stay with her and they carried on a 15 minute conversation with him but unfortunately didn't have a recorder. Yeah. But they continue, he continued to answer questions by lighting up lights and so forth for 15 minutes and so forth. Uh, we went on down that evening and we set up the spirit box in the snack bar. And this particular group has a spirit guide they get the same spirit every time. It tells them whether it's safe for them to proceed or not. And he ironically, what they knew about him, put him in the same age category as her dad. He had actually said he had died in a plane crash in Laos in the 1960s. How oh, yeah. And uh, And as I said, I went through a couple of spirit box sessions with him. Same spirit would come up every time, tell them whether it's safe to proceed or when we needed to get off or whatever. And uh, so she asked him if he could find her dad. And she asked for him by his nickname. And he goes, oh yeah, he's a good friend of mine. And I thought, that's ironic because they, they both be about the same age. Next thing, this voice comes on and calls her by name and she had not given her name. And says, I am your father. And of course, the first thing everybody says is what can I do for you? They never answered that question. And uh, she said, who would you like me to tell that I have communicated with you? And he named her sister and her nephew. Wow. And of course we recorded, we got all, we had all this on recording and so forth. And I leaned over and I said, I, I thought by some strange case, there might be somebody on the ham radio out there that is, you know, putting in a signal that might realize who she is. That's something. a coincidence of being the exact names, you know. Who knows, it's a small town. Yeah. But he went by nickname. Very few people knew his original name. And I said, ask him for his original first name. And she said, Dad, if this is really you, what is your original first name? Gave it back to her immediately. Oh. <laughs> and uh, then, like I said, it was asking you earlier, did you pick up things on recordings you didn't hear? When we went back and listened to him, there's actually one point that I heard that night where he comes back again, calls her by her first name, and says, I love you. Oh, awesome. Yeah. It's got to be comforting to her. Actually, it went the other direction. Oh, it really? not have anything to do with anything like this anymore. It just yeah. flipped her out. You'd think so, it would give it some kind of, you know, com you know common effect now, or not yeah, effect. Yeah, I would have to, you know. Um, I talked to my dad through one, and exactly, you know, uh, same thing. You felt a little peace from that. Huh? You felt a little peace from that, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the first time 
I did it. It was actually the first time I, we did the group over at another building, and I asked for my my dad. And every time I asked for my dad, I'd hear his nickname, but it was almost like it was down at the bottom of a well, you know, way off somewhere. And I didn't say anything to them. I didn't even react to it. And when they came back up the next time, they said, you know, we were reviewing those tapes from a spirit box over there at the other building, and uh, they said, you know, every time you asked for your, your dad, we kept hearing the word Jack. I said, does that mean anything to you? And I said, that was my dad's nickname. Yeah. You know, so this room here originally had glass like you saw upstairs. Right. Uh, and this originally actually was uh, before we had an ICU. That's where our cardiac patients went so we could monitor them through the glass and so forth. The call light on that in that room would go off constantly when there was no patient in there. You put a patient in there, it worked fine. But anytime it was empty, it would go off nonstop. That's somebody playing around. Also, uh, and this has been reported by several nurses that worked this floor at midnight, ironically. A woman in a white dress with red hair will walk down that hallway right there, come to about where that camera tripod is, and go right through the elevator doors. And she was spotted one night by one of the other. I wasn't with the group. We had a big group one night. Uh, we divided up into two different groups, and she was spotted by the other group. I was oh, not yeah. with them. I'd never seen them. But our sheriff's deputy and his son, up, he said, I thought I'd run over coming around the parking lot down there. If you'll notice, there's a big chimney yeah. down there. He was coming around that corner, going down there, had his son in the car with him. They were, they were taking a shortcut through to the uh, video store and thought he'd drive by the hospital, just check things on. And she came walking out of the, out of the wall and right across the drive there over toward the chimney. And his wife was a nurse that had seen her. So he, you know, he described her perfectly, you know, to his wife that he had seen the spirit she had seen here numerous wow. times working the night shift. Um, and incidentally, that they never burn body parts in that chimney. That's a rumor that goes on. I, I hadn't even heard that. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, uh, so that's a good bit of what uh, the stories and everything. That, that's it. That's, that's pretty it. much it. We've done the entire circle. I mean, we really appreciate what you've done tonight. I mean, you really shed a lot of light on what's maybe myth and what yeah. is actually taking place in the hospital. Uh, we're going to go out of here. We're going to go check on Donald. He uh, felt a little ill in one of the rooms and had to go back, back out to the trailer. Um, and we're fixing to go live on Periscope where hopefully y'all can come in and watch us as we do the investigation. And again, this, we really appreciate everything you've done and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Hopefully you can send us some of those photos that you're talking about and we yeah, can yeah. share them. I think I've still got them saved on disk somewhere and stuff and I'll pull them up. Let's do what we do best, guys. Investigate. Um.